dies, we want to know about it. Um, but I think that's pretty much it. Okay. Okay, so welcome. Uh, this is the smallest classroom I have ever taught in at CMU. <laughs> and I am so thrilled about that. I guess I should be standing in front of this camera. Sorry, guys. Um, so there's all these other people online. Um, thankfully, not too many of them. These are, these are some of your, uh, your TAs here. Um, and, uh, and, and honestly, um, I think the thing that I am most looking forward to this semester, aside from uh, the actual material of this course, is getting to know you guys. Because usually uh, I'm teaching courses like 601 that have 500 students. And uh, most of my like efforts in terms of learning names of people goes towards learning the names of my TAs. Um, <laughs> because there's uh, not too many uh, more of, uh, not too many fewer of them than you guys here. Um, and, um, and so this course uh, is, uh, and it's an advanced topic and uh, it's intended to, uh, to, to go uh, sort of well beyond uh, what we see in your typical intro to machine learning course. And, uh, and along with that, uh, for 618 students, there's, uh, there's an assumed project component, uh, which I think is where we get to sort of interact technically uh, the most in, in terms of this course. Um, oh. I guess uh, I was so concerned with making sure that everybody online could see that uh, I didn't bother to help you guys with that. Let's see. There we go. Um, so, uh, give this a second to warm up. Okay, so today, uh, what we're going to be talking about is, is roughly uh, sort of a couple different pictures of the big ideas of this course. And uh, towards that end, um, we'll, uh, we'll think about the actual problem that it is we're trying to solve. Uh, we'll think about, uh, at a really high level, some of the mathematical tools that are going to be involved. Um, and uh, we'll look at a bunch of different examples of the kinds of tasks that we're going to be concerned about. So, this course is fundamentally about structured prediction. Uh, and in some sense, we actually considered calling this course uh, structured prediction. Uh, but uh, the, that word is sort of an, uh, or that technical term is a little bit nuanced. And, uh, and it depends on which field you're in, what that actually means. Um, and so in this course, uh, we're, we're going to use the term structured tr prediction uh, to talk about uh, cases where you're actually making uh, predictions where the output is structured. So what do we mean by structured? Well, if you, if you go off into uh, industry and you interact with non-machine learning people, uh, there's this clear distinction between what people think of as structured data and what people think of as unstructured data. And so structured data examples consist of database entries, um, well, the transactional information could often be uh, represented by database entries, um, but it might be coming from somewhere else. Uh, Wikipedia info boxes are a great example of structured data, knowledge graphs, hierarchies. Um, so all of these uh, share properties, which is that there's some strict organization of the actual data. And typically, there's also some schema that specifies how the data uh, should live in, in that particular structure. Okay. So unstructured data is sort of everything else. So uh, written text, right? Be it in uh, Arabic or English or whatever language. Uh, images, videos, spoken language, audio. Uh, but, but it could also be music. Um, uh, it could be sensor data coming from a variety of different sensors. So all of these are different examples of, uh, of unstructured data. OK, so, um, so a quick quiz here. Uh, which of the following are structured data? So easy question, spreadsheet, XML data, JSON data, and mathematical equations. So select all that apply. OK, so take a second uh, and turn to your neighbor and discuss what you think the answer should be here, and then uh, we'll get some responses. OK, so take uh, 60 seconds to do that.
Well, you should probably introduce yourself to whoever's sitting next to you. So, uh, if you don't know them, maybe start. <laughs> Okay, so seemingly simple question, but you guys already had a lot to talk about. Um, so why why is there so much to talk about here? What what is what are people t chatting about? What are does someone want to offer an answer? Uh, is there a good answer? Are there no good answers? <laughs> what do you guys think? Yeah. Yeah, we think XML and JSON are definitely structured data, uh -huh. but we are not sure about the spreadsheet. It could be structured data, and it also could not be structured data. Okay. Uh, this is a good answer. Uh, actually, so this would be a good moment for us to ask the people on the live stream uh, if they can hear anything. Um, so I think there's there's probably like what did we guess like a, a minute delay or something. So uh, so why don't you go ahead and ask them whether they heard uh, whether they're hearing me and whether they're hearing anything that other people are saying uh, and just a reply on chat. Okay, so. Um, uh, so this is a good answer. Does anybody disagree? Yeah. So we thought otherwise. We thought spreadsheet is really definitely the structured data because at least it's rectangular, you have row and columns. But whereas with XML and JSON, even though they're structured, they're highly flexible. You can almost squeeze anything into it. So in that sense, we're not sure whether it is considered structured. Right. Okay. So I think I kind of also agree with that. Uh, so did anybody talk about mathematical equations? <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah, so we, we also consider we're disagreeing a little bit, uh, so like whether or not they were structured or not. Um, but as we're thinking about, you sometimes can decompile like a mathematical equations into like a graph, in which case you can think of it as like a structured, mm -hmm. something structured, basically. Yeah, so we could actually imagine uh, there's lots of different uh, representations of mathematical equations. Uh, so the way that we tend to write them uh, pretty much everywhere in the world. Uh, involves, you know, say, putting a plus sign between two numbers, but there are other conventions where you put the plus sign before the two numbers and wrap that in parentheses. When, and now that actually looks kind of like, a, uh, like some sort of graph representation. Uh, so yeah, so mathematical equations, yeah, it, it sort of feels like, well, there's flexibility there, but there's also a very well-specified semantics to mathematical equations. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the flexibility that exists in, say, handwritten mathematical equations certainly would allow you to kind of move into that unstructured space. Okay, so why do we get these difference of opinions on, on the other ones? Well, uh, so I think it's true that XML and JSON uh, do have a well-specified schema, right? There's, there's a proper way to write an XML file and an improper way to write an XML file. The challenge there in thinking of it as structured data is that uh, you could pretty much represent anything in XML data, just the same way that you could represent just about anything in a spreadsheet. You could kind of uh, it, uh, you could take an entire document uh, of just pure written text, and you could pack that into sort of one element, a one single XML element. Okay. Well, now, yeah, technically you have some structure there, but all of the real content is sort of unstructured. Okay. And so, similarly with a spreadsheet. Uh, you know, you might have uh, some of your columns, say, say you even had something as simple as, as a setup where uh, the rows of your spreadsheet corresponded to, uh, to records in a database and the columns uh, corresponded to fields. Well, if those fields themselves uh, were uh, sort of simple data, like 
binary values or multi-class values, then sure, we have something structured. But as soon as you open up the spreadsheet to allow arbitrary text in it, uh, or uh, even you know pasting the, the binary representation of an image into a cell, well, now we're back to unstructured. And so in general, these kind of correspond to uh, semi-structured data. And mm, we'll see whether I can actually view uh, okay, so slight glitch is that I don't actually know how to get to hidden sides uh, while also screen casting. So, <laughs> um, so there's a hidden slide in here that says something about uh, semi-structured data, but it's not terribly important. Um, and, uh, and it would have just pointed out that semi-structured is kind of this term that people uh, typically use to refer to a bunch of data that consists of some structured data and some unstructured data. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, in our case, that term could sort of be generalized to, to also capture these sort of funny middle cases where, well, it's sort of structured, but it's sort of not structured. Okay. Yeah, question. So doesn't the, also the definition of whether it's structured or unstructured depend on, for example, the end use? Um, okay, so then in that case, would, you, would, would it be okay to say that in irrespective, every single one of these is like... Uh, what do you call it, semi-structured? Uh, yeah, in some sense. We could probably just say everything is semi-structured and call it a day. And in some sense, uh, the, the point of this is that, you know, there are these uh, somewhat artificial distinctions that we like to draw between different types of data. But the point is that they are kind of artificial distinctions. And so what we're going to be concerned with is formalizing this notion of structure in a way that we can work with it mathematically, algorithmically, and conceptually. Okay. So, uh, so we can get there really quickly if we just think about classification versus structured prediction. So uh, in your typical uh, intro to machine learning course, you see all these different models for classification. And... Uh, and the goal there is to predict some label y from some vector of inputs x. Okay. And then what we're saying is that in this course, we're going to be concerned with problems where you have that same kind of input, some vector x. But now we're going to predict a vector that is our output. Now, a vector doesn't sound very interesting, except that a vector can represent all sorts of interesting structures. So as soon as we've gone from one number to, say, j numbers here, uh, we now instantaneously have a setting where uh, we're able to actually uh, reason about things like graphs and trees and Wikipedia info boxes and uh, electronic health records and any, any sort of interesting structure that you want to encode inside that vector. So this is actually a good moment um, uh, for me to pause and just ask uh, among the people in the room, uh, so how many of you uh, took um, a course that covered uh, graphical models uh, in, say, two or more, with, with like two or more lectures on graphical models? You get, raise your hands. Uh, okay, so... Uh, and then how many of you took 315? Okay. And then for those of you, okay, so interesting. Yeah, so I'll send out a survey to kind of get a, a, a better feel on this. Um, so what I know is that there are people coming into this course with different backgrounds. And um, so I'm going to kind of try to figure out how best to, to handle the fact that some people who, say, have taken 601 with me have seen a little bit more of Bayes nets than, than those who haven't. Um, and... Uh, and so actually the beginning of this course, uh, we're actually going to be going off and talking about sort of structured prediction in the context of deep learning, uh, which I think is going to be this, this area that nobody has uh, in this room has really uh, studied heavily. So, uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll figure out exactly how to deal with sort of your, your differing backgrounds when we get there. Okay, so, um, so I wanted to paint this picture of a contrast uh, between classification and structured prediction. And really, I guess, what's up here could also be sort of generalized to, to be talking about uh, regression as well. And um, I'm actually going to swap this. 
And let's see what I just did. Okay, that's good. <laughs> um, all right, so, uh, so when we're talking about uh, classification, uh, we usually think that the input can be sort of interesting semi-structured data. Okay, same thing goes for uh, the structured prediction set. Um, and as we just said, the output in classification and, reg and regression is just a single number, an integer or a real. And the output for structured prediction is a sequence of numbers representing that structure in some way. Okay, so uh, at least in linear models, we'll talk about a lot more interesting models than just linear models, but in linear models where we have features, uh, features can be sort of arbitrary combinations of input-output pairs. This is actually a paradigm that uh, we often sort of gloss over in your typical uh, machine learning course, this notion that uh, the, the feature extraction can actually look at the output label and have interesting features on the output label. Um, but this is not something that's unique to structured prediction, and it, it's, a, it's a distinction that I'll kind of draw out later in the course. Uh, and so that same thing actually can happen in structured prediction. So that's not a difference uh, between the two. Uh, the real big difference is that, you know, in classification, the output space is tiny. And, or typically tiny, I guess there's this case of uh, extreme classification where uh, we're working with uh, typically on the order of, you know, a million labels or something as your output space. Uh, and technically, we still talk about it as classification, but it's, it's, it's sort of rapidly approaching the space of structured prediction in, in many sort of aspects. Um, and so for structured prediction, one of the typical defining characteristics is that we think of the output space of, for our predictions as being exponentially large in the input space. And so where classification and regression inference is trivial, like the actual prediction that you make at the end uh, is usually just some dot product and then you find some arg max over a small set of numbers. Here, uh, inference is going to be the key problem that we look at. In general, uh, the, the inference problems that we're concerned with are either NP-hard or sharp P-hard, and uh, they often require approximations as a result. Okay, so um, uh, we'll mention a bunch of examples of structured prediction. Um, here's a handful. Um, let's just jump into some of them. So, um, so this first one is uh, one of my favorites, part of speech tagging, uh, where uh, we can think about a sentence like, uh, time flies like an arrow, and uh, this, this sentence has all these sort of different meanings depending on how you interpret the part of speech tags for the sentence itself. So uh, in the first sample, uh, time flies like an arrow is the colloquial meaning where, you know, time moves really fast. Uh, in the second example, now we have these things called time flies, it's a noun phrase, and they're kind of like fruit flies. And they have this strange affinity for an arrow. Um, so, you know, these, this same sentence can actually get part of speech tagged two different ways, uh, and we get two samples as a result of that. Uh, and then we have other sentences fly, fly with their wings, and with time you'll see. And it seems like, you know, in this funny case, uh, all of the vectors that we're working with, uh, both input and output, actually have the same length, right? There's five words in every case. Okay, so we could actually work with a setting like this of length five sentences, and we could construct a data set where we distinguish uh, sort of our x's and our y's by uh, random variables, and the random variables here are depicted by circles, and their values are, are the actual value shown in that circle. And, uh, and so now a sample consists of a vector x of words and a vector y of part of speech tags. So, uh, so here's another example of handwritten uh, uh, digit or letter recognition. And uh, so again, the input is uh, this sequence of little uh, pictures, and the output is the appropriate corresponding letter, say, in ASCII, uh, corresponding to that little image. And, um, and so the, the key point that we can take away from an example like this is that uh, often there are actual letters in here where the handwriting is so sloppy that you couldn't possibly understand what that letter meant, what that letter actually was, uh, if it was entirely by itself. And it's only when you actually see it in the context of the entire word uh, that it's obvious that it's uh, one letter. <coughs> 
So like, uh, particularly like whatever this letter is, uh, the strange looking uh, thing next to the B. Um, it's an O, we all know that, but uh, it has some you know, funny extra little bit uh, hanging off the top of it. So um, speech recognition is this interesting case where suddenly uh, the input is a spectrogram. And uh, a spectrogram, uh, if you're not a speech person, you could just think of it as some image that is capable of representing the actual acoustic sounds of speech. And um, roughly, the, the y coordinate corresponds to different channels, and the, the, sorry, the y axis corresponds to different channels, and the x axis corresponds to time. And so each little window here corresponds to, say, some 10 milliseconds of audio. And uh, and the outputs here are phonemes, uh, or representations of little bits of sound. So just like before, uh, our output is now some sequence, but now there's, there's this interesting challenge that results, which is that uh, the input might have totally different length than our desired output. Okay? If you think of uh, you know, each uh, pixel as a time step in x, Right? The number of horizontal pixels here uh, is dramatically more than the actual number of phonemes that we want to predict. And so there's going to have to be some sort of alignment that we somehow infer between the input spectrogram and the output phonemes. Okay. So um, we could also think about uh, problems like object recognition. And, um, and here we might be in a setting where uh, we have images and we're trying to predict labels for them. Uh, but uh, we could try to make the problem a little more interesting by decomposing the actual image into patches. And from there, we could actually posit that there's some latent labeling uh, that describes the actual object's parts. So now, uh, we don't just look at this image and, and see, you know, magically a, a label of a leopard coming out. But rather, uh, what we do is we build a model that first tries to says, say, well, uh, this outer patch seems to be grass. Okay. And then that yellow patch there, that seems to be a head. And this green patch, that seems to be a body. And these four blue patches are legs, and there's a tail. And so with this in mind, we could start to attach uh, random variables to both the underlying pack patches of pixels, those we could call our x variables. And we could also attach uh, these z variables being a label for each one of those patches. And we could say that if you want to predict that this is a leopard, you're not just going to predict the leopard variable direct uh, from the pixels, but rather you're going to first try to figure out what these labels of the patches are. And then once you have some sense of what those labels are, you're going to connect them up based on proximity. Because uh, you'll be concerned with uh, their proximity to each other because you know, there, there shouldn't be like a leg above a head, usually, uh, in, if it's a leopard. Um, I guess a, a leopard could be like laying on its back or something. But uh, usually legs come below the head, right? And so uh, there would be some notion of, of directionality and proximity with these labels, and that would actually inform how uh, we learn about them. And then we could connect all those labels up to our final uh, y variable that's giving the label of the image. And this would help us because uh, if, we, uh, if we see that uh, you know, all of the patches correspond to um, say something like the parts of a tree, then it's pretty unlikely that, uh, that the final image is a leopard. Okay, so, so why is this going to be hard? Well, um, when we want to predict something, uh, if we're just doing classification, then you know, the final step here is usually to predict some y hat, uh, which is the highest probability label given our input x. And maybe y, y hat here comes from the set plus 1 minus 1. But if we're trying to do structured prediction, then what we're concerned with is predicting this vector y hat, which might be exponential, and there might be exponentially many of them uh, 
in the set calligraphic Y from which we're considering possible vectors. So even if you just think um, that X and Y are both uh, length n binary vectors, then already we're in this situation where the number of possible output binary vectors uh, is exponential in n. There's two to the n possible binary vectors. Okay. So if n is large, you're not going to want to write a for loop to iterate through uh, those two to the n possible y vectors. Okay, so fundamentally, it's useful to think about uh, structured prediction in terms of uh, sort of these four components. Uh, the first one is the actual data that we're working with. The second is the model that we're going to build. And I guess there's this funny question of where your objective function lives. You know, is the objective function fundamentally part of the model, or is it part of learning? Um, and you know, I prefer to kind of attach it to the model. Uh, but if you if you like to think of it a different way, you could also think of the objective function as being sort of part of learning. And then inference uh, is going to uh, solve problems for us, like predicting the most probable assignment to the labels, but also giving us marginal probabilities for the label, or computing the partition function uh, for the actual model. And those are going to be used as uh, subroutines with inside learning. Okay. So these three problems, finding the best structure, finding the marginals, and finding the partition function, are critical problems to the success of structured prediction. And uh, we'll actually spend a good chunk of the semester thinking about how it is that we can actually compute those things. Uh, we'll also spend a good bit of time thinking about how we can design learning algorithms that can uh, actually handle these exponentially large search spaces. And, uh, and then as well, we'll also be talking about how to define models that are appropriate for particular uh, tasks and data sets. So uh, in your homeworks, um, you'll actually be building out uh, examples of all of these different facets. And um, uh, I think one of the things that I, I tend to think is extremely important is that you'll also be building them out on real tasks that people care about. Uh, so uh, we'll be asking you to, to, to do learning to search on some sort of sequence to sequence model. Where you'll be thinking about um, designing uh, the actual learning algorithm that is appropriate for uh, learning uh, in a space where inference looks like a search algorithm, like a greedy search or a beam search. Um, and so this has the feel of, of, of not something out of graphical models, but out of, out of deep learning. Um, but then we'll also kind of uh, step somewhere in between deep learning and graphical models, and we'll think about how can you build uh, deep learning modules that are actually essentially doing graphical model inference so that the predictions that we make at the end of the day are better. Okay, and so in this context, you'll be thinking about, uh, say, building out modules that are essentially, you know, an algorithm like, say, loopy belief propagation on a conditional random field for, say, a computer vision task. Um, as well, we'll be thinking about uh, other learning algorithms like uh, the generalization of uh, support vector machines to uh, the structured prediction setting, which is they're called either uh, M3Ns or structured uh, SVM. Uh, and we'll be thinking about how you can use tools like integer linear programming uh, uh, to actually provide you with something like black box inference, uh, such that you can uh, effectively come up with uh, really efficient solutions to these inference problems, uh, and then utilize them during uh, ma um, margin-based learning. Um, the fourth thing that you'll be thinking about is uh, building a Gibbs sampler, uh, which is a particular uh, way of doing approximations uh, of these inference problems. And uh, we'll talk about uh, your homework assignment there. We'll actually be looking at the, the problem of topic modeling. And then lastly, uh, we will be 
the, the last homework assignment will be about variational inference, which is another approximation method that views inference as an optimization problem. Uh, and there, you might not actually uh, do any implementation, uh, but maybe more focus on, on sort of the mathematical side of things. But the point is that in those other four cases, um, the, the homeworks are going to be really uh, hands-on at looking at how you actually build these things to solve real problems like uh, speech recognition and computer vision problems, uh, natural language processing like topic modeling, uh, and hopefully something with medical diagnosis. Okay, so why is it that we want to divide uh, structure into its pieces? Well, uh, there's a lot of reasons. Um, one of them is that uh, this division into pieces makes things amenable to efficient <coughs> inference. Um, and it's also going to enable sort of more natural parameter sharing uh, during learning. And then finally, we'll also allow uh, easier definition of sort of these fine-grained loss functions. So typically, uh, when we think about loss functions, uh, we, we kind of just look at a, a task, if it's a classification task, there's just kind of an obvious loss function, which is like error. Okay. Uh, if it's regression, usually we, we, we think about, well, maybe we're going to have a squared error, or maybe we're going to have like some mean absolute error, but there's not that many options available to us. Once we're thinking about structured prediction, though, suddenly there's, there's actually a lot of options available. And so thinking about how to actually craft loss functions uh, becomes an important challenge because uh, sometimes you can actually make your, your learning algorithm loss aware in a way that capitalizes on uh, what it is that your downstream task actually is. Um, so another nicety of decomposing a structure into its pieces is that uh, it's going to provide us with a clear depiction of our model's uncertainty. And it also is going to make the specification of interactions between those pieces a lot easier. And then lastly, it'll, it'll hopefully lead to sort of more natural definitions of uh, of the actual problem as a search problem. Okay. And basically, uh, this notion of sort of decomposing a structure into pieces is, uh, is going to be that sort of fundamental step in formulating a task as structured prediction. OK, so uh, what do I actually mean by decomposing? into pieces. Well, let's, let's think about it through some examples. So, uh, so here's the first one, and this is scene understanding. So here, uh, you can imagine that what we're trying to do is take in an image and not just say, you know, is this an image of a leopard or not? But we want to we want to have labels on all the different components of the image and predict all of them simultaneously. So here uh, is actual system output on this image. And you can see that uh, it's, it's actually doing two things here. One, it's actually segmenting into different regions. And then the other is that it's labeling those regions. And so what we find is that uh, the, for the most part, uh, these labels actually look pretty reasonable, right? So here's a human, uh, and there's some rock behind it. There's some sky up there and a mountain. Uh, the system thought this was a tree. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's some grass on the mountain. We, uh, but I guess it could actually be like a bunch of trees off in the distance. So, uh, so maybe my own classification algorithm needs uh, some more image data uh, than is available in this picture. But um, there's certainly not water hanging on the rock. Um, but the, the system made a mistake there. OK, so what is, what is its notion of decomposition here? Well, uh, for one, there's going to be some variables that are decomposing the image into separate regions. And then the other is that it's actually going to come up with tags for those regions. Okay, and the question is, what are the interactions that exist between those variables? Well, uh, for one, there's this question of sort of semantic plausibility of nearby tags. Uh, and then another is the sort of continuity of tags across visually similar regions or patches, right? It, it sort of wouldn't make sense uh, that you would uh, have, you know, this very uniform surface where all the pixels on the rock kind of look somewhat similar, and you're kind of gradually transitioning between lots of li different labels, you know, maybe rock on this side and then 
uh, some, some water right next to it and then some grass right next to it, right? If all of the pixels are looking kind of the same, then uh, those variables that are close to each other should probably have the same variable. Okay, so what about semantic plausibility? Well, uh, this particular system output was taking semantic plausibility into account. Here's what happens uh, in a system that does not take that into account. Uh, so now we have a human, uh, which is atop a horse, which is atop a sailboat, which is sitting in some snow. Um, so like, this is completely unreasonable to any human that sees these labels, uh, but the system doesn't actually have the capacity to model the kinds of interactions that we think are just totally obvious. Right? And if you look at the data, the data actually supports this notion that sailboats usually don't sit on snow. But because the model isn't aware of the fact that, uh, that there's a snow label below a sailboat label, it's just all it's doing is looking at the image to produce these labels. And so it can make this sort of stupid mistake. So there's a sense in which um, uh, you, know, you could do all the feature engineering in the world, and you could build the most complex uh, sort of convolutional neural network. And yet, if you're still making independent predictions of labels, uh, then you, you might still make this mistake. And so structured prediction says, well, what we should be aiming for is a model that's able to account for those actual interactions in the output so that we don't make these sorts of stupid mistakes. Okay. So, uh, so this is another example of, uh, that's, that's closely tied to machine translation, uh, which is that often we're concerned with aligning two sentences, or in this case, sentence fragments. So the English sentence fragment in the past two years and then uh, a Mandarin sentence fragment that corresponds to it. And so what we're looking at is uh, now slightly a, a, diff a slightly different representation uh, where uh, we're going to say each of these squares corresponds to a random variable. And its value is on if it's shaded in, and it's off if it's not shaded in. So what that means is that we now have uh, 20 random variables for each possible alignment between each pair of words. And the model is going to try to predict uh, which of those are most likely. Okay? And so the kinds of interactions that we would care about are things like uh, word fertilities. Right? It, it sort of doesn't make sense if you have one word in the English sentence aligned to all of the Mandarin ones. Right? Or uh, you usually don't want too many discontinuities. Right? So we typically tend to see that in most languages, at least left to right languages, uh, the, the actual interactions tend to be, uh, or sorry, the actual alignments tend to be monotonic, meaning that there's not a lot of uh, sort of crossing uh, or jumping around of words in the sentence. Um, so we won't, we won't go into the other ones. But uh, another example would be uh, congressional voting, where uh, you could imagine trying to capture sort of all of the different um, uh, goings on of Congress uh, with some random variables, right? And some of the random variables might uh, capture the actual representative's vote. So those are the white ones. Uh, and then the dark shaded ones could represent the actual text of all the speeches for a particular representative. And so that would mean that you can see for each of the white circles here, there's some attached uh, dark circle uh, that's connected to it, indicating that the, the speeches for that person uh, interact with the actual votes that they're making. But then there's uh, other um, sort of interesting variables here corresponding to the sort of local contexts that exist between pairs of representatives. Right? <coughs> so maybe we know something about how these different pairs of representatives interact with each other. There's a lot of public information about how congresspersons interact. And so we could say then that uh, if you look at those local contexts and that pair of representatives, you know, if you know that they go to breakfast together every Tuesday morning at 8 a.m., uh, and you know one of their votes, 
Did you think you also know the other person's food? Probably, right? Like the guy that sits down with the other guy at 8 a.m. every Tuesday, they're probably going to kind of vote the same. And so these sorts of interactions, if you, if you can predict what, if you can identify what they are, uh, then you might be able to actually properly model uh, what's going on in these sorts of complex problems. Now, this particular problem uh, is an interesting one that uh, captures something that uh, we'll talk about briefly in later parts of the course, which is that uh, congressional voting is sort of an example where there's only one training example. There's and really only one, or, or, and the test example is the same one. There's not this notion of, uh, you know, like Congress has been around and there's been these long-term interactions between people over many years. And so to even create training examples, you would need to think about how to decompose the real problem of congressional voting into something containing sort of artificial distinctions like uh, individual years of Congress or something like that. Um, so medical diagnosis uh, is an extremely complex problem, um, but it's a place where machine learning has great potential to have huge impact. Um, and so what we're looking at here is actually an example of an electronic health record. And uh, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, sort of typical things that, uh, that when you come into the doctor's office that you get, like uh, your temperature and your blood pressure. Uh, but then there's also this assessment that happens often, you know, by the nurse who walks in and they, they ask uh, about, say, you know, whether you ha have been having any sort of pain and whether it's gone or not and whether the pain was uh, worse with deep breathing or not and, uh, and so on. And uh, there's also other things like uh, symptoms that they could check off if you exhibit them or uh, risk factors if they can identify anything in your social history. And so the variables here are kind of obvious, right? They're just, you know, the content of each text field, the check marks, uh, the drop-down menus, the actual values of these things. But then the interactions, to even figure out what they are, you might need to actually talk to a doctor to figure them out, right? They're going to be sort of groups of related symptoms, maybe ones that are predictive of certain diseases. Uh, they're going to be things like connections between social history and symptoms, or connections between risk factors and some lab results. These are the sorts of things that you're going to actually have to uh, kind of tie together if you want to be able to make some medical uh, di diagnosis. Okay, so um, I want to do another quick exercise here, which is uh, centered around Wikipedia info boxes. Um, so here, what we're looking at are uh, four different Wikipedia info boxes. Uh, I think these were the ones that happened to pop up on uh, today's uh, random selection of Wikipedia pages. So here we have an Australian football player that I've never heard of. Uh, and uh, an and equally uh, obscure uh, Bollywood movie, um, though possibly a classic. Um, I think it's from 1955. Um, some, uh, some a, a page about history that, um, and uh, even a page about uh, a classic arcade game. Um, so what you can see is that uh, sort of people have come up with uh, ways of taking all sorts of interesting aspects of Wikipedia and art articulating these little info <laughs> boxes that are really structured data about the content of the Wikipedia page, right? So common things that show up on uh, info boxes for people are things like the date of birth, uh, and if they're a sports player, you know, what teams they're a part of, maybe what years they were there, uh, height and weight, I guess, if, if they're sports players. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the obvious things are kind of attached to movies, and um, uh, the, you know, something like a, like a kingdom uh, I wouldn't have actually expected to have uh, a, an info box, but clearly people have kind of come up with uh, these sort of structured fields, like what kind of government was it? A monarchy. Um, what year was it established? 2003 BC, and so on. Uh, and even for, uh, 
uh, for something like an arcade game, uh, people have kind of come up with schemas that actually kind of succinctly describe uh, different aspects of that arcade, arcade game. Okay, so suppose you want to populate some missing info box fields. Okay, what are the variables and what are the interactions? Okay, so take another 60 seconds with whoever you're sitting next to and uh, and particularly, I, I think the, the variables, there's not too much to talk about, but I think the interactions, there's a lot to say. So go ahead and take a second to think about that. Okay, so um, so what variables would you uh, define if you're building this model to fill in uh, missing info, info box fields? How would you start to cast this as a structured prediction problem? The entire input text is one part of it. Yeah, so, so we could say that this entire thing uh, is like one random variable and uh, maybe has the name x or something. Um, yeah, so, so that would be a fine variable to have. And uh, in fact, we would say that the entire text is always going to be observed. And by convention, when we have these uh, observed random variables, we're going to shade them in. We'll talk more about this particular no visual notation later, but uh, so yeah, this is a good variable to have. What else? Yeah. This stuff already in the info box? Yeah, so we probably want a variable for every little detail already in the info box. Okay, so that means we could have uh, uh, a random variable for the Central Park Task Force and for 1980 and for uh, the founders, maybe we have a, a separate ones for each founder, or maybe we have one that's a list valued random variable or something like that. Uh, the location gets its own random variable and so on. Okay, so, uh, uh, so what other variables could we have? Yeah, exactly. So we need random variables for the things that we're going to actually predict because these are also shaded in, right? We actually know what these values are. But then we need all the things that aren't on the Central Park Conservancy info box. What on earth goes on a Central Park Conservancy info box? Uh, I guess in addition to, uh, they already have location, coordinates. Um, who writes these things? Um, so you could think of yourself as doing a great service to the poor person who filled in the Central Park Conservancy uh, Wikipedia info box. Uh, maybe like uh, found it is on there. Um, budget, great, thank you. So this is missing. And, uh, and so we could have a random variable. You can call it y, y1, y sub budget. Uh, that we don't know the value of. Okay, uh, and so then we could also have, say, another one that's like number of trees that they are responsible for. 
or something. And that could be y sub trees, you know. And so we're going to have a random variable for each of the, the fields that is missing. What about um, a field for uh, the date of birth for uh, the Central Park Conservancy? Would we have that random variable? Well, probably not, right? It, it's, this doesn't really apply, right? This isn't a person, so it doesn't really have a date of birth. Uh, and so there's going to be all of these fields that we are not filling in. And so the interesting thing that we'll have to take into account here is the fact that uh, there's going to be sort of way more possible variables than we would actually want to include. <coughs> and we're going to have to take into account the fact that you know, different types of Wikipedia pages are going to have different types uh, of fields attached to them. OK. So what about interactions between these variables? Yeah. I have a different question. Sure. So how exactly is this structured? Say again? How, like, why is this a structured problem? Ah, because, uh, so it doesn't have to be. Okay. And so uh, if we say that there are no interactions between these variables, then sure, it's just a classification problem, right? You have, uh, you know, if you just are predicting uh, the budget for this particular page, uh, then uh, you could just treat all of this other stuff as sort of fixed input data. And you could just predict the budget and be done. Okay. So the point at which it becomes a structured prediction problem is the point at which there are interactions between the actual output variables. Okay, so thoughts on what the interactions could look like? You don't have to stick to uh, the Central Parks Conservancy example if uh, if it's easier to think about these. I have a question. What do you mean by interaction specifically? So I guess what we're concerned with are cases where uh, the different random variables, uh, we tend to have some insight into the fact that they interact or that they sort of move in tandem, right? Yeah. So, so if we go back, right, um, so what we tend to have is things like uh, you know, if you're trying to, to diagnose a disease, right? and uh, and at the same time uh, you're concerned with, uh, say, filling in uh, the symptoms. Okay. So now simultaneously, uh, we could be concerned with uh, the actual interactions between. Oh, sorry, I guess I had social history of symptoms here. Uh, so we could be concerned with the fact that um, if, if you know that the person is a smoker, they're going to be uh, more likely to already have coughing as a symptom, a priori. And so the data will actually kind of bear that out. And so if you were just looking at filling in different aspects of the electronic health record uh, in isolation, then you wouldn't be able to capture that interaction. So here, uh, an example would be, um, so say we were trying to fill in uh, different aspects of, uh, so, so suppose, for example, uh, we didn't have any information about Ryan Myers. OK, so uh, the the sort of simplest possible thing that we could be concerned with here is if we were jointly trying to predict his height and weight from the text. Okay. So if you just try to predict them uh, independent of one another, uh, there might be like a couple different heights mentioned in the article, um, both of his height as well as some other players or something like that. And so to figure out uh, which is his height, you're going to need to, you might have an advantage if you also are able to predict his weight simultaneously. Um, so, like, it's sort of ana anatomically uh, implausible that uh, he, his height would be, uh, say, the length of a football field, right? Um, and so, if you know the sort of typical relation between height and weight, uh, then you might know that how that ratio usually interacts. And so if you already kind of know what his weight is, then you might do a better job of predicting his height. 
So that's, that's an example of an interaction. OK, so any other, can you think of other cases where we're trying to fill in multiple missing fields at once, and sort of what kinds of interactions might exist there? Yeah. Uh, so oh, sorry. Back behind. Sorry. So the Central Park example? Yeah. The location of the coordinates? Yeah, exactly, right? So if you know that the location is New York, uh, then suddenly you have a lot of information for the coordinates, right? Uh, similarly, uh, or yeah, did other people have other examples? Yeah. Can the interaction be like, if you have missing fields, like the founders and then found it, um, like the, the text, when you see founders, like there would be a hypothesis that found it here, it's like you had the sentence. Oh, sure, yeah. So now we could actually, so here we kind of did this, this really coarse thing, which is that we took the entire input text and we called it one random variable. But a much smarter thing to do would have been to sort of decompose that into smaller random variables so that we could actually isolate the interactions uh, between the missing uh, outputs and individual components of that input. Yeah, so, so, those, are, uh, so those are interactions between uh, sort of input and output, uh, and they differ from interactions like the location and the coordinates only in that uh, it's going to be sort of computationally more difficult to work with the kinds of interactions that exist between pairs of output random variables. Okay. Yeah? So maybe the Arcata machine example, mm -hmm. you know, if you're missing a bunch of the information on the machine and you just know what the system is, a lot of stuff might be paired, so you might know a lot of the components you spell yep. out. Yep, absolutely. Um, okay, so so where are we going this semester? Well, um, uh, there's all of these interesting contrasts that we're going to start to paint. Uh, and I think one of the fascinating parts about looking at this sort of broader picture of machine learning problems is that we can talk about uh, contrasts that we couldn't even talk about in sort of a basic machine learning class. Um, so some of them will actually be familiar, things like a generative versus discriminative <laughs> distinction. Uh, but then uh, we'll also talk about things like local versus global normalization, or the tree width of these graphs, whether it's high or low, and how that affects the tractability of inference. Uh, we'll think about uh, cyclicity or acyclicity of an actual graph representing uh, the thing that we're trying to build. Uh, we'll talk about um, sort of different kinds of models in terms of sort of exponential family models where uh, everything is kind of clean and nice, and neural networks where suddenly everything is not so clean and not so nice, um, but works really well. Um, and then if we're looking at sort of a neural case, we could think about deep versus shallow. Um, in the context of inference, we'll talk about exact versus approximate inference, uh, and particularly like which aspects of those, those model contrasts admit uh, exact inference versus approximate inference. Um, we'll think about different types of inference algorithms, right? Practically, whether they're solving by dynamic programming or sampling or optimization. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll also talk about uh, possibly maybe some familiar inference problems or maybe some new ones to you, like the, the map inference problem, marginal inference, and the partition function. Uh, within learning, uh, we can think about distinctions between whether we have full supervision or partial supervision. Uh, we'll talk about whether the supervision is loss aware or not, uh, whether our, uh, our learning is sort of probabilistic or non-probabilistic, and even uh, things like whether uh, we're viewing learning from a frequentist uh, perspective or a Bayesian perspective. OK, so uh, this is a lot of sort of keywords. And I thought it would be useful to kind of uh, paint this picture uh, in uh, of sort of the kinds of contrasts that exist here, uh, but uh, through a simple example. So, um, so let's actually take a look at one of my favorite kinds of examples here, uh, which is uh, that of thinking through uh, an HMM. And um, so here, this roadmap by example, um, we could say that, um, that we're going to start by, uh, by thinking about just the HMM model. And 
I guess what we're going to do is uh, we're actually going to have some structured representation uh, of the HMM concept, right? Okay, so uh, I'll put its name in a little box, and then I'll, I'll kind of put it inside this little circle. I'll put an actual picture of it. Okay. But then HMMs have uh, these properties. Um, so HMM stands for Hidden Markov Model. Um, so one of the properties is that it's a locally normalized model. Uh, another is that it has a Markov assumption. A third is that it's a probabilistic model. And um, uh, it's also uh, trainable in a lot of different ways, but uh, I want to think about the case where uh, it's trained in a fully supervised way. And um, then we could say that uh, this graph representation of the hidden Markov model uh, doesn't have any cycles, so it's an acyclic model. And that the particular fully supervised way that we're going to be training an HMM is by a maximum likelihood estimation, which is kind of a frequentist uh, approach here. Okay. So, okay, so uh, how can we get something more interesting? Well. Uh, the first thing we could do is we could say, well, instead of having a, globally, a locally normalized model, we could have a globally normalized model. Okay, so if we did that, uh, now we could talk about a new kind of model, uh, namely an MRF or a CRF. Or let's, say, let's call it just an MRF here. And an MRF, uh, we would draw a slightly different picture, which looks almost the same, except that there's no arrows. There's just these little edges connecting uh, all those circles up. Okay. And uh, here, the distinction of locally normalized versus globally normalized would just be that, you know, if we have some joint distribution over, say, A, B, and C, the locally normalized version would decompose. So it might be something like, you know, the probability of A times the probability of, say, B given A times the probability of C given A. And it's just the product of, say, a sequence of normalized probability distributions. But if we want something globally normalized, well, we could instead define that to be something like uh, the score of A times the score of B and A times the score of C and A. And if these scores were just arbitrary real numbers, we wouldn't get back the probability. But if we said, OK, these scores are now going to be non-negative numbers, and we're going to have something called a partition function, z, that makes sure that they uh, sum to 1 for all possible values of a, b, and c. Now uh, we have a globally normalized model. Okay. So another change that we could make there is we could say, well, this MRF is actually uh, what's called a generative model. And uh, we could instead come up with a discriminative model, which is the discriminative analog to that generative model. And that discriminative model would be a CRF. And it would look almost the same as the MRF, except that we would have to treat uh, the actual emissions as observed. And so we would shade those in. Those are part of the input always in this case. Okay. So um, there are other sort of little changes that we could make along the way. So a Markov assumption assumes that you kind of have only access to, say, the previous random variable in time. But you could say, well, let's take infinite context instead. Okay. And if you did that, you would no longer have an HMM, but you'd have a different kind of model. Any thoughts on what it might look like? Well, we'd just take those circles and we'd change them to little rectangles. And by changing them to rectangles, suddenly we have a graphical depiction of an RNN. Okay, nice. OK, so uh, you know, we could keep playing this game uh, where we say, um, 
you know, we're, we're going to change from probabilistic to non-probabilistic and fully supervised to partially observable and uh, acyclic to cyclic. We'll draw that one out because that's a fun one. Uh, so if we went from acyclic to, uh, say, a cyclic graph, uh, then we could have something that's like, uh, say, a skip chain HMM. And that skip chain HMM uh, would sort of have some of the familiar arrows from before, but it might add some connections that uh, skip across random variables like so. Oops. Okay. And um, you know, if we wanted to do inference on that skip chain HMM, well, we would probably be needing something like a loopy belief propagation algorithm, uh, which itself is a message passing algorithm. Uh, but we don't need to stop there because we don't have to use uh, message passing algorithms. We might instead prefer something like sampling algorithms. And so if we did that, we could keep the same model, but now we could work with a Gibbs sampler for inference. And, uh, but uh, keeping the model exactly the same. And uh, again, if we didn't want to do message passing, but we wanted to do, say, inference as optimization, well, no problem. Now we just have variational inference. So we have a different variation, but on the same model. <coughs> and so uh, we can kind of start to, to fill in all of these different contrasts, uh, and each of these different contrasts kind of leads us to sort of a new topic for discussion of how do we actually build, you know, the non-probabilistic version of the HMM. Well, we're going to need something like structured SVM. How do we build the, the partially observable, not the fully supervised, but partially supervised version of the HMM? Ah, well, we're going to need something akin to uh, the EM algorithm or variational Bayes. Uh, and if we don't want to be frequentists, well, we're going to have to think about uh, how to actually do Bayesian inference, where we uh, infer an entire distribution over the parameters. Okay, so, um, so we'll fill this sort of uh, beginning of a diagram out uh, more once we actually know what kind of these different terms are. But they'll allow us to conceptualize all of these different uh, ways of, of sort of building models and inferences uh, and algorithms. So, um, all right. So I want to end with uh, with just sort of the highlights of the syllabus. Um, so uh, my assumption is that uh, the course policies, which are posted on the website, are required reading. So all of you should go to the website and just uh, read all the policies. Um, I took care to write them out for you. And um, there's sort of two ways that you could get there. Uh, one is 418.mlcourse.org, the other is 618.mlcourse.org. They'll both redirect to the same place. Um, so the highlights are, um, uh, are posted here. So the first one is there's this distinction between the grading breakdown uh, between 418 and 618. Specifically, uh, 618 is the same course essentially as 418, except that it also has a project component. Um, so uh, you'll find then that in order to account for that, uh, the homework and the final exam are sort of reduced in, in their weight. Uh, so uh, essentially, you'll still participate uh, in that final exam, uh, but its sort of final impact on your grade will be a lot less. Um, uh, the midterm exam uh, is going to be on Thursday, October 3rd, and it'll be an evening exam. Uh, and then the final exam will be scheduled by the registrar. Uh, the homework, uh, there's going to be, I guess actually, sorry, I said about four. There's going to be really five assignments. And uh, the, the sort of tentative deadlines for those, uh, you can actually look on the schedule page for. Um, they're kind of roughly sketched out there. Um, and that also includes uh, estimates of deadlines for the project components. Um, there's going to be six grace days for homework assignments, and uh, you also get partial credit for submitting late. But no submission can ever be submitted 
uh, after four days late without an extension. Uh, and an extension request uh, is really uh, to handle emergency situations. So the kinds of emergencies that I'm talking about are kind of detailed on the actual syllabus. Uh, recitations will be uh, right here in the same place and time. Uh, we'll announce ahead of time uh, when they're happening that already on the course uh, schedule page, there's a tentative schedule for those recitations. Uh, and roughly, there's sort of one per homework and per exam. Um, and, uh, and then for the people in the online section, our assumption is that you in the online section will be joining uh, in person for this. Um, so the re readings are going to be required, and they'll be online. My recommendation is to read them afterwards. There's, uh, there's definitely going to be some readings where, you know, uh, like the, the actual coverage of the reading goes sort of beyond the scope that we actually want to uh, cover in this course. And so um, uh, we'll kind of highlight where that's the case uh, when that comes up. Um, and then... Uh, We'll use a couple different technologies. Uh, I think the ones that, uh, so we'll definitely use Piazza and Gradescope. And I think we'll evaluate whether to use Autolab or Gradescope for programming questions. Uh, that's actually sort of not decided yet. Um, and then on the academic integrity front, uh, we really want you to be collaborative uh, in this course. Um, that's really encouraged. Uh, but on the programming assignments in particular, we want you to, uh, when you collaborate, uh, essentially, we want you to work together, but uh, not by sitting next to each other and coding, but rather by standing at a whiteboard together and talking about the problem at a high level, and then erasing the whiteboard, going your separate ways, and coding up solutions separately. Uh, and this is really fundamentally about uh, sort of providing a good opportunity for, uh, for you to uh, invest actual time in uh, really deeply understanding what these algorithms are doing and how to go from sort of the, the math on paper to uh, something that actually works and uh, solves the problem. Um, okay, so office hours will post on the Google Calendar page. I think they're not, there's none posted as of yet. Uh, my office hours will typically be just right after lecture um, and uh, search, we'll probably, I've never taught in here, maybe we'll go just sort of to the ne a nearby table uh, up there. Um, so, uh, during lectures, you should feel free to interrupt and ask questions. Uh, and when I ask you a question, I actually am looking for an answer. I'm not asking rhetorical questions here. Um, and uh, basically, uh, th there's all this educational research that shows that uh, interaction improves learning. So, uh, this is really, really important uh, that you interact with your peers, both in class and then also out of class, on homeworks and on, uh, on projects and so on. Uh, the, there's a textbook that uh, you could go get. It's a great reference textbook, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty thick textbook. Um, I wouldn't expect you to like read through the entire thing. Uh, and it, uh, I won't actually assign readings from it, but uh, if there was one textbook that you got for this semester, I, I would recommend this one. It'll, it'll cover a lot of the, the really uh, sort of intensive topics that we, that we hit on. Um, the, the prerequisites, I think, are pretty clear from the syllabus, an introductory machine learning course, significant programming experience in uh, college-level math, and uh, the, the expectation is that you will be proficient in the basics of Python such that you can like, pick up Python uh, for the homeworks where you need it. Uh, and then the last detail here is uh, we have a project for 618 students only, uh, and this will be conducted in teams of two or three people. And the goals are really to pre present some empirical comparison of, say, competing methods. And so uh, I, I was kind of careful in framing this as you, you uh, the expectation is not necessarily that you will be uh, producing, you know, uh, NeurIPS or ICML or you know top machine learning conference uh, level research, uh, but rather that you'll be kind of headed in that direction uh, through uh, through <coughs> empirical comparison. And so, so what I'm more concerned with is actually that you're doing that level of empirical study, uh, but not necessarily that it need be some totally novel thing that you're going to go turn around and publish immediately. Uh, I think it's also fine if 
uh, if you're already kind of doing research, to, to kind of think about how you can uh, interface real novel research into your project as well. And we can talk about that. Um, but it's not entirely necessary here. And, um, uh, and there's sort of typical milestones along the way. Um, and with that, I think uh, we'll wrap up. And if you have any 